Hey guys, it's Dr. Childs here, and today I want to discuss with you a condition known as hypothalamic obesity disorder, um, and why this condition may be causing the majority of your thyroid-like symptoms. Okay, and so I'm going to explain what this condition is because it's a fairly... Um, it's not a new condition. Most uh, most uh, weight loss doctors are aware of it, but they're usually aware of it in the setting of severe trauma. Now, um, what has happened nowadays is that patients have, they are developing this condition as a result of repetitive chronic stress and other environmental and behavioral factors, which we'll discuss a little bit lower. So this, this uh, condition that um, wasn't felt to be as common is now uh, we're seeing it's becoming much more common. So that's why we want to talk about it here. Another really important reason to discuss it is because, as I said before, this condition mimics the symptoms of hypothyroidism exactly. Um, the problem is this isn't a thyroid disorder. And so what happens is patients who, who may have hypothalamic obesity disorder, they wrongly believe that they have hypothyroidism, which leads them to um, bounce around from doctor to doctor you know, trying to get thyroid hormone replacement therapy because when I say it matches the symptoms, I mean, it's almost exactly, and I'll talk about all those below. So that's that's a important point number one. Um, another important point is that patients who um, take thyroid medication for this problem may actually do worse. Okay, so another really important thing. And that may explain why some patients who take um, some patients, they you know, they they think they have the symptoms. Um, they take T4 only medication or some other thyroid medication. They actually gain weight on it. So this may be one of the reasons that that occurs. Um, and then lastly, uh, one of the one of the hallmarks and for di for the diagnosis of this condition um, has to do with with the way that patients present. And what I mean by that is, if you are a patient who um, has the symptoms of hypothyroidism and is on thyroid medication but not getting better or not improving, there is a very high likelihood that you have this condition. Okay, so now that that's out of the way, let's talk about what it is. So your hypothalamus is is a, is a portion of your brain um, and it's very important because it controls and regulates several processes in your body. Okay, so so I talk about these things here, and I list the studies about how you know how this actually occurs. But we'll talk about just a few of them because um, it will help you understand why um, a dis why dysregulation in the hypothalamus results in symptoms that mimic hypothyroidism. So your your hypothalamus controls first of all your basal body temperature. Okay, so any dysfunction in this system will result in low body temperature. It also controls your resting metabolic rate, which is the amount of energy that you um, uh, consume on a daily basis, which is, d which that indirectly or directly, kind of depending on how you look at it, controls your body weight, okay? So any disruption in this may cause either weight gain or weight loss, and we'll talk about why it causes weight loss in just a minute. It also regulates how much heat you produce um, through the autonomic nervous system. So this is the um, neurotransmitters like... Um, like epinephrine and norepinephrine, etc. Um, it manages and maintains your appetite as well. And, and finally, it helps with your daily circadian rhythms. So any dysfunction to the hypothalamus results in problems in all of these areas. And so what happens is normally the, the way the system is supposed to work is your hypothalamus senses through various hormones, such as leptin and insulin and things like that, it senses when your body has extra fat. And this is how it's supposed to work normally. So let's say you, you know, you eat a bunch of meal because whatever, you've been temporarily stressed out or something, you're eating a lot of food, you gain five to 10 pounds, and the, the fat that you gain secretes certain hormones that, that get into your bloodstream and go to your brain. And your brain is supposed to recognize those hormones, and it's supposed to react by saying, hey, we have extra fat in our body, we don't want this extra fat here, so let's take steps to get rid of it. And so what it does is it says, okay, let's slow down the appetite a little bit. Um, let's increase your metabolism. Um, let's increase thyroid hormone um, production. Let's, let's do various factors, you know, changes in hormones and things like this to help the body get rid of that fat. Okay, so that's what's supposed to happen normally. Now, with hypothalamic obesity disorder, that entire system becomes dysregulated. Okay, meaning it doesn't work very well. So instead of doing what I just said, instead your brain 
thinks that you're in a state of starvation. It thinks that there are not sufficient um, calories in your body. Now, meanwhile, you may be incredibly overweight. So there's a there's a mismatch between what your brain thinks is actually happening and what is truly happening elsewhere in your body. So this is how patients may be 50 to 100 pounds overweight and still be starving 24-7. This is why they still gain weight no matter what they do. Okay, so let's talk about specifically what happens in this condition. So with the dysregulation of the hypothalamic or the hypothalamus, several things occur. Number one, your metabolism slows, slows down severely. Um, your appetite increases dramatically, okay? Your body temperature lowers dramatically. You reduce the amount of heat uh, production norm that normally occurs in your body. Um, and you are, your, body send, your brain sends signals to constantly store any calories that you consume as fat. And this occurs even in the presence of caloric, uh, calorie restriction or caloric restriction. Okay, so obviously many of these things mimic um, hypothyroidism. Now, the, the question is, what causes this? Because traditionally, we thought that this condition was only caused by severe trauma. But that turns out to not necessarily be true nowadays. So we have to kind of expand our understanding of what this disease state actually is. So there are several things that we, we know contribute to the development of this disease. And many of these things um, are behaviors or lifestyle changes that, that, that patients have, have, that have become more common among patients um, nowadays. So let's go over these. So number one is recurrent yo-yo dieting and constant calorie restricted diets. So that would include anything that you can imagine that reduces the total amount of calories that you consume. So this could be the HCG diet, this, I don't know, any diet you can think of. There's tons of fad diets out there, um, but they all have one thing in common. They always reduce your calories. They always um, result in temporary weight loss. And then you always gain the weight back. But that cyst, that, 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 um, that cycle that occurs is, is damaging to your body and it, damages your hypothalamus but you can think of it as a cumulative effect so doing this one or two times is not a big deal but doing this 10 times 15 times 20 times now you're now you're starting to get in the range of where you're going to develop permanent damage to well not permanent because it's not permanent but but significant damage to your hypothalamic or hypothalamus and hypothalamic function so that's number one number two would be untreated hypothyroidism i spend a lot of time on my blog talking about why that's a big deal, how to actually get the proper treatment for your thyroid, et cetera. So I'm not going to harp on that right now. The second one would be binge eating or eating disorders. So again, this kind of goes along with number one. Anything that causes you to um, reduce the amount of calories that you're consuming or um, dramatically change how you're eating, your schedule with eating, you know, things that would trick your body into thinking you're eating more than you already are, anything that confuses the, the brain to kind of fat cell um, connection can, can result in this. Then certain hormones can do this as well. So leptin resistance, again, that comes along with recurrent yo-yo di yo -yo dieting, etc. Um, another big one is chronic stress, and an, and an even bigger one is constant and persistent lack of sleep. So the general American lifestyle is such that it promotes this type of behavior and these type of, uh, especially high stress, like uh, Americans, and I assume this is true all over the world as well, People are under a, a lot of stress constantly, even driving to work, commuting in traffic, um, having issues with your boss, having issues with your spouse, your kids getting into trouble at school. All of these things start to stack up and they work against you over time. So what, what might not have caused issues to you 10 years ago now builds up and with the addition of everything else can cause a lot of problems. Um, and then we can't underscore the effect of sleep. So there seems to be um, a regulatory process between the hypothalamus and melatonin and, and that system together that's supposed to tell you, that's supposed to bring the body into a state of relaxation and um, uh, allow for proper sleep and uh, allow for proper rhythms. Um, but when you dysregulate this, this pattern and that connection, it, it, you tend to have a higher risk of developing hypothalamic obesity disorder. So that, that is a, that's a big one, which means that sleep must be something you have to fix. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about the symptoms because we mentioned before that they mimic hypothyroidism exactly. So these are the most common. So what, where I got this data from is, um, uh, researchers took a group of 50 people who presented with typical symptoms of hypothyroidism. And their goal was to assess whether or not these patients had hypothalamic obesity disorder based off of some diagnostic criteria. Okay, which is, which, and they, they said this, if you have three symptoms, it's likely that you have 
hypothalamic obesity disorder or hypothalamic dysfunction. And if you have four or more symptoms, then it's then you do have it. That, that's that's the diagnostic criteria, criteria that allows you to be um, labeled with this condition. So the symptoms that they looked at were these: number one, fatigue, but 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 a dramatic form of fatigue, not just like low energy levels. Two is temperature dysregulation. So that could include um, low body temperature or the inability to raise body temperature with exercise or the inability to ra raise body temperature with, um, with a fever, things like that. Uh, the next one was weight change, and you can see that that was the highest at 88%. So especially constant weight gain despite changing your diet and exercising or the inability to lose weight um, when doing the things that I talked about previously. So if you were somebody that, uh, you know, you were able to lose weight in the past by, by dieting, and um, you know now you're not, well, that's not normal, and that puts you into that sort of weight change category. Another one would be changes in sleep, but specifically um, insomnia or dysregulation of that circadian rhythm. So maybe somebody who has difficulty falling asleep, or maybe somebody who wakes up two to three times in the, in the night no matter what, that's a dysregulation of that, that system. Um, another big one is pain. So you can kind of see as well that there's a correlation between hypothalamic obesity disorder and fibromyalgia because many of the symptoms of fibromyalgia um, coincide with the symptoms we're talking about but specifically patients who fell into this category who had this condition 68 percent of them had all of the diagnostic criteria as far as trigger points go for fibromyalgia so there's some overlap between all of these these diseases which suggests to me that uh, we just need to take a broader we need to expand our understanding of, of all of these disease states because they probably um, are related to one another. Okay, so fibromyalgia, um, th we'll talk about the therapies below, but but just put that in the back of your head that 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 that, that condition tends to um, at least share a lot of the same symptoms with hypothalamic obesity disorder. Next on the list was mood disorders. So um, eighty percent of people had mood disorders, and that could be anxiety, depression, anything like that. And then almost forty percent had libido issues. And then the last one, which is a big one, was sympathetic or parasympathetic complaints. So that could be the things like the body temperature we discussed previously. It could be things like dizziness, lightheadedness, um, issues with constipation, the inability to exercise, changes to the heart rate, like lower lower heart rate. So if you're somebody who is number one overweight and number two does not is not conditioned like an athlete but has a resting heart rate of 50, that's a problem. That's not normal. Okay. So of these 50 patients, 68% of them were determined to have hypothalamic dysfunction, meaning they had four plus symptoms. And 22% were considered to, ha to likely have hypothalamic dysfunction, meaning they had three symptoms. So that totals about 90% of these 50 patients fell into this category. Now, the issue is that physicians aren't really aware of this condition or don't appreciate it but this study outlined some of the some of the less conventional therapies that I've been talking about for a long time and showed that these therapies actually help these people quite a bit who fall into this hypothalamic dysfunction which is why this is um, a really exciting study it gives us insight into how to help people but proves that a lot of the therapies that I've been talking about um, actually have efficacy um, in this patient population so how do you actually diagnose this so first of all if you can go up, you can go up to this list and just, you know, check yourself here. But if you have four of these things, then you, then you have the condition by definition and it can be diagnosed clinically. If you have three of them, it's, it's very likely. But the other important thing is, um, if you fall into this category, um, then you are very, very, very likely to have it, even if you don't have all those symptoms. And it is this. Um, hypothalamic obesity is very likely if you have hypothyroid symptoms, um, that do not resolve after taking thyroid medication. So many of you listening to uh, or listening to this or reading this probably fall into that category, um, which means that this is really important for you. So let's talk about how to actually treat it. And I've gone over these treatments. I have a lot of information here, so I'm not going to be able to go over all of this here. Um, but I would recommend if if you're following along and you think that this that this uh, that this uh, that you might have this condition, you go through and you read through this. You look at all the the literary studies and the scientific studies, um, and kind of compare yourself to that. So number one treatment: injectable diabetic medications. So we're talking specifically about the GLP-1 agonists, um, things like Saxenda or liraglutide. These tend to be required because they're helpful in reducing some of the hormone imbalances that occur as a result of the hypothalamic dysfunction. So remember, we need to be aggressive about this this treatment because by definition if you have hypothalamic dysfunction you're going to be very difficult the treatment is going to be 
need to be aggressive for you because the chances are very high that all of the conventional approaches have not worked for you already, right? Like you wouldn't be listening to this if, if you were able to just reduce some of your calories and be back to a normal weight. You're not one of those people. So you have to be aggressive with this. Now I show all the studies about how the GLP-1 agonist affects your body. I also show that um, even taking it by yourself, which I don't recommend, but if you took this medication by, by itself, you could lose up to 10% of your body weight. But again, we're going to, we need to layer these therapies on top of each other. That's how we get the best result. Number two is the, is uh, one of two medications, but low dose naltrexone plus or minus the combination of Wellbutrin. So the benefit here is that naltrexone can actually help um, help regulate that hypothalamic function and restore the the communication between your fat cells and your hypothalamus, so that your brain realizes that it's actually not in a state of starvation. So that's the real value here. Now, previously, I've said that LDN can help with the body set point malfunction. Now, what we'll probably find is over time, this body set point malfunction and hypothalamic obesity disorder will really probably be combined into one issue. But for now, this is this is our understanding of it. But again, that's one thing. Another thing is diet. But in this case specifically, we want to focus on the Mediterranean style diet. And that's what was studied in, uh, that, that was the diet that was studied in this setting. Now, what's interesting here is that um, the Mediterranean diet is different from most diets um, and in that it, it obviously there's a lot of fruit and vegetables but it also has a fair amount of carbs in there now carbs can be kind of confusing to some people because they've been they've been you know kind of it's been drilled into their head that in order to lose weight you have to reduce carbs that's not always true um, I've had plenty of patients who actually increase their carb content from high quality food sources and they lose weight when they weren't able to before so you have to realize that the, uh, the macromolecule ratio macromolecule ratio that you use in your diet depends heavily on the hormone imbalances in your body okay so your diet there's not a magic best diet for weight loss instead it needs to be molded and adapted to your body now specifically in this condition the Mediterranean diet seems to do pretty well um, but but I, I've, I've discussed it in my weight loss guide I discuss how to actually kind of figure out what you need the next one is antidepressants. Um, now, specifically Wellbutrin, but other ones have, have been shown in studies to work. Now, the idea behind this is, again, we're trying to normalize. We're trying to, first of all, we're trying to normalize what your body thinks you should be eating and how many calories you're actually burning. So there's a disconnect between between those two values. Now, under normal circumstances, if you were healthy, your body would do something like this. It would say, okay, I'm burning about, I'm just going to make these numbers up. I'm burning about 2000 calories per day. So I'm going to, so I'm the brain and I'm sending signals to the body, to the stomach and all these other factors to consume about that amount, right? It's your, your brain is always trying to match the amount of calories you burn to the amount of calories that you consume. Exactly. That's why most people they don't have issues with weight. If they're eating healthy and they and they didn't develop these hormone imbalances, they don't really have that problem. Their weight kind of stays the same. So the, the idea behind the antidepressants is to normalize that. Now, next up on the list is HCG. And I'm not talking about the HCG diet. Obviously, the HCG diet is not a good thing. Um, however, HCG, the hormone, if coupled with healthier diets, um, like we've talked about, and not a calorie-restricted diet, can actually improve um, weight loss. And so the way that it does this is, is, is through several mechanisms. I'm not going to talk about those in this video just because of time, but HCG can actually improve thyroid function. It can actually normalize sex hormones like progesterone and estro estrogen. It can actually uh, improve ovulation. It can increase testosterone um, in men, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess I did talk about those a little bit, but the point is that's been studied and docu documented well. Next up on the list is fentramine. Again, fentramine is really an appetite suppressant, but it should, it, traditionally people say, okay, well, let's use fentramine every single day. We'll reduce your appetite. You'll lose some weight. And then once you stop the medicine, you'll gain it back. That's not how to use it correctly. That's just how most doctors use it. Um, instead, using it for a hypothalamic obesity disorder, it can be, com it can be combined with HCG, which allows you to episodically um, and periodically reduce calories during a certain time frame, um, but not enough to cause the restriction but you can control it. And that's how you use fentramine successfully. I talk about that in my weight loss guide. I'm not going to talk about it here. Um, the next one is daily exercise, but specifically daily exercise to tolerance. So that's going to be different for each person. But what I mean here is you need to exercise to the point where you are reaching the capacity that you have. Now that could be 
walking for some of you. That could be intensive strength training for others. It, but you need to figure out what that is and go to that point. And then lastly is thyroid tre treatment, specifically with T3. Now, I won't, again, I've harped on this in previous videos. Go through my videos in, in the past if you want to see exactly how to, how to dose and how to use these medications. But here I want to make a special, uh, a special point, and that is this. The patients who have hypothalamic obesity disorder may need supra-physiologic doses of T3 temporarily. What that means is I may have to, or your doctor, may have to give you um, uh, uh, higher doses of T3 than your body would have normally produced for a short period of time. Okay, and we do that, we do that with other things. That's not an uncommon uh, treatment practice, but it, it freaks a lot of doctors out. But it, it's not, it's not as long as you control it, you don't experience any of the negative side effects that occur as a result of long-term TSH suppression in the body, and instead you get a lot of the benefits. So that's that's kind of an idea around how it needs to be used um, in this situation. So that's it. Um, this condi I mean, there's a lot more to it than that, and I'd recommend that if you found this interesting or if you um, you know, if any of, if you identified with any of these symptoms or any of the, any of the concepts that I've been talking about, you go through this, you read it in detail, and then let me know if you have any, any specific questions, because this is a, this is a newer concept, um, and it, uh, it, it's, it's very important for a lot of you, so it'll be, it'll be really important to, um, first, first of all, diagnose it if you have the issue, and second of all, make sure you get the right treatment, because getting that treatment can kind of be difficult unless you have a doctor willing to work with you. So that's all, guys. Uh, let me know if you have any questions about this, um, and uh, otherwise, I'll uh, talk to you guys soon.